All praises due to Allah. Assalamu alaikum, family. Oh, wow. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the most merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah who came in the person of Master Fahd Muhammad. And for some of you, that name might sound very, very strange. However, he came not only to raise us, to elevate us, to teach us, and to give us the thorough knowledge of ourselves, but he came, in essence, to make us into himself, a supreme being. And so we are so grateful for his coming. And not only did he come, but he took one from amongst us and elevated him, poured his spirit into him. And that person is none other than the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we're so grateful for his sacrifice, for his willingness to sit at the feet of God, to learn, to obey, to submit his will, to do the will of God. Because if not for his sacrifice, we would not be here. And in his wisdom, he knew, like his teacher, that it was incumbent and necessary for him to find one who could bear his company, who could be a vessel who had the capacity to contain the level of energy, frequency, thought that he desired to pour into him. And we're so grateful that he found well, that God made one for him in truth in the person of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And so it is in the name of these three men that I greet you all again in the greeting words of peace of Aslam Alaikum. I want to thank my brothers that came before me, um, Brother Gilbert Muhammad, Brother Stan. Um, and what's resonating in my mind right now was something that Brother Gilbert said, which is about the power of truth. And that without truth, what do we really have to stand on? And so when God comes to give us a greater knowledge than the one that we have, that's not rooted in the mindset or the knowledge of this current world, but one that is in truth rooted in universality, that's infinite, this type of truth is one that can carry us forward. And so my lecture for today, brothers and sisters, is entitled The Anatomy of God. And as I was mulling over what to uh, name this lecture, I toyed with utilizing that word anatomy because it's almost to those who, who um, don't understand, it's almost like a paradox, a contradiction, because anatomy by definition deals with the branch of science concerned with the bodily structure of humans, animals, and other living organisms, especially revealed by dissecting and separating the parts. It deals with the study of the structure or internal workings of something. And so I said, well, maybe that's not a good word. People are going to be like, what? <laughs> but in truth, as Brother Gilbert said, we can't, we can't, um, we can't hide today. We are living in such a time that it's necessary for us to be very bold, very clear about what our stance is and what the truth is. So we're talking about the anatomy of God, <laughs> the branch of science that's concerned with the physical structure of the human being. And as we delve into this, I pray that I'm able to um, share some knowledge with you that is going to expand, further expand this idea and concept. Y'all all right? Yes. Praise be to Allah. Let me tell y'all, this is a weighty thing. Ooh, it don't matter how many times you <laughs> are blessed to come before the believers, whether it's five seconds or five minutes or for an hour. That's right. It is something that will keep you up at night. Oh, yes. And not necessarily in a negative way, but when you are charged with delivering the word of God, to the people of God, it's, 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 a, it's a serious thing. And we don't, I don't take it for granted. So I thank each and every one of you for being here, to be, for being present and giving me your attention and your energy. And I pray to Allah that he clears the way, that his will be done. Um, so let's get into it.
The title is straightforward, so we're going to get straight into it, all right? Y'all all right? Yes. Praise be to Allah. So the anatomy of God. We defined anatomy already as the branch of science concerned with the bodily structure of the human being. And so because we live in a world where the only knowledge that we have been exposed to for the last 6,000 years is the knowledge that's been given to us by the Caucasian, the ruler of this dispensation of time, we have no concept of what anything means outside of how he has defined it. So when we say define, define is something that outlines a thing, that gives it its meaning. So anatomy and the anatomy of God, when we think about anatomy, we're only thinking about the typical systems that they tell us and their function, right? Our skeletal system, our, our digestive system, our reproductive system, our respiratory system, and our central nervous system. Okay, so we, when you go into science, so we're gonna get into a little science today, right? Is that okay? Because we're talking about the anatomy of God and essentially we're talking about you and I, brothers and sisters. We're talking about you and I and how can we grow to truly love a thing if we don't know a thing. So the more that we grow into the knowledge of self, as the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said, growing in the knowledge of self is growing into the knowledge of God. Because as we know, God is man and man is God, right? So God came to give us life and life more abundantly. Well, one might ask, in order for God to give you something, Surely you must already be alive in order to receive it, right? So we're talking about physicality, anatomy. So in order for God to give you something, you have to be able to receive it, lest that exchange never happens. So in order to receive the gift, you have to be present. So yes, we are here in our bodies, in our physical bodies. We are animated. We woke up this morning. You may have ate a little breakfast. You know, I'm side-eyeing the Muslims because we ain't, you know, we don't eat breakfast. But you may have ate a little something. And yes, God willing, we will go home tonight. We will hug our children, plan our week, and get up and drive to work tomorrow morning. We are breathing. We're moving. But are these activities actual activities of life? How do we define life? We are doing these things, but when God came, he said that he came to give us life and to give us life more abundantly. Not just life, but to take us beyond living, to expand us into the abundance of life, abundant living. So brothers and sisters, we are so blessed today because we have access to a knowledge that is not limited by the understanding and interpretation of a low thinking man. We are not limited by the understanding and interpretation of a low thinking man. That is not, we're not even limited by the histories of nations and civilizations whose evidence of existence we look at in awe. Recently, myself and my children, we just went to the Museum of Fine Arts, right? So we're walking through the museum and we see all of this cultural expression that gives us insight into the manner, means, and ways of these civilizations. We see the pictures on the walls and how they were dressed, the furniture, right? But God came to give us an understanding where we don't have to be limited just by the histories of nations and civilizations whose evidence uh, we look at in awe. Even though the knowledges that they had could not save them for their inevitable fall because none of those civilizations exist today. So this world gives us history, that short history, as a means of quantifying its grandeur and its greatness. But we see that all of those civilizations have fallen down. So if we, if we truly desire to be something that's sustainable in its existence, we have to have a knowledge and a truth that goes beyond what the enemy has given us, what the people of this world has given us. And this is the reason that God came. He came to give us a knowledge that would take us into the next cycle of our lives, that would take this planet's life into its next cycle, and ultimately into the next cycle of cosmic evolution and expansion. Because the universe is always expanding. If we're not expanding, if we're not growing, then we truly are not living. And when we look around, when we look in our communities, when we look at the state of the country, when we look at the state of the human being, 
we really, this doesn't make sense when we say the anatomy of God because how we are manifesting, how we are showing up in our reality doesn't look like God. It doesn't look like perfection. It doesn't look like order, right? It doesn't look like force and power. So something has gone awry. That's right. yes, so everything living is growing, expanding, and evolving. So the question that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan asks us is, how strong is our foundation and can we survive? And truth is the only foundation that's worthy of establish a, establishing a kingdom on, establishing a reality, a life is based on one of infinite truth. Y'all with me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Truth is not affected by agenda or perspective, brothers and sisters. I'm going to say that again. Truth is not affected by perspective or agenda. For an example, when we look into the hour when we look into the night sky from where we are currently resting in the atmosphere, we can look up into the stars and we can possibly pinpoint the Big Dipper or the Little Dipper. And it's named the Big Dipper or the Little Dipper based on our perspective, how it looks, how it's shaped from our perspective. However, if we were to take another position in the cosmos, say go to Venus and look at that same star structure from another vantage point, it would not look like a spoon, a Big Dipper at all. It would look like something completely different. But the truth is those stars exist and they are what they are no matter what perspective or vantage point you look at them at. So truth is not affected by perspective or agenda, meaning if I have an agenda, that doesn't change what the reality of that situation is. Truth is not ill-affected by agenda. And we're living in a reality where we're getting our knowledge from a man, from a people who most definitely have an agenda. An agenda that is in complete opposition to the will of God. So it is and it doesn't require your, and the truth doesn't require your acknowledgement for it to be. If you never look into the sky, never witness the cosmos at all, it still exists whether you choose to acknowledge it or not. It is. For the last 6,000 years, brothers and sisters, we have been spoon fed our knowledge of everything in existence from a made man with an agenda. And his agenda is pinpointed in the scripture. The Quran tells a story of Iblis, Shaitan, or the devil, and it says, Iblis, and gives us insight into the devil, this mindset, his agenda. In Surah al araf or the Elevated Places, verse 16 and 17, it says, this is Shaitan speaking to God. He says, because you have judged me as erring, surely I will sit and wait against them on your straight path. Then I will come to them from before them and behind them, from their right and from their left, and you will not find most of them grateful. So that's the agenda right there, brothers and sisters. In his disappointment, in his uh, upset at being judged, he declared his agenda right then, that he was going to come in a straight path and to confuse the people. And we would be so confused that we would not be grateful. We would be so discombobulated and, and ill-informed that we wouldn't have, no longer had the capacity to be grateful. So that's the agenda. But these are activities, and are, but are these everyday activities that we're engaged in, are they considered activities of life? But God is the one that truly defines what life is. It's evident in this that how we define life and how God defines life is not the same. What we have been made to believe is living, brothers and sisters, is not living at all. The scripture says, my people suffer from a lack of knowledge. What knowledges have we been deprived of? What are we lacking when it comes to the knowledge? Well, according to the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, we're lacking in the knowledge of self, the true knowledge of God, the true knowledge of the enemy, and the knowledge of the time. And if you gain the knowledge of self, you gain the knowledge of God. And so therefore, this is what you have, the anatomy of God, because God is a man. So armed with self-knowledge, we are able to use ourselves more efficiently. That's what the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said in the Final Call newspaper. 
Armed with self-knowledge, we are able to use ourselves more efficiently. If you don't know yourself, how are you going to make use of yourself? And if the knowledge that you've been given to define and utilize yourself is, in, is improper, then no matter where you strive to go with that knowledge, it's going to be off, right? He said he's going to steer you off the straight path. So this knowledge is supremely important. So here we talk about life and life more abundantly. In John verse 10, God says that he came as a thief. He says the thief cometh not but, for, but to steal, kill, and destroy. But God came that he might have life and that they might have life more abundantly, that we might have life more abundantly. And that abundance comes by a redefinition. So when you're introduced to the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and you hear for the first time that God is a man, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> because all our life we've been taught that God is a spook. He's a mystery. He sits up on high. That he's omnipresent and omnipotent. And that, that, that he is. So it's not necessarily that we have been given a total it could, a total misconstruction of the truth but we've been given truth mixed with falsehood right. and the honorable Elijah Muhammad said that's one of the that's one of the worst things that you can do is to mix truth with falsehood and that's what we've been given brothers and sisters and because truth has been mixed with falsehood we don't know how to make actualize ourselves we don't know how to fully activate the reality of God that rests in man that's right. in the new education paradigm a lecture given by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, he uh, reframed our understanding of what education is. Reframed our understanding of education. When you typically think of science, you're thinking about something outside of yourself. But the Honorable, Elijah, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan strove to put us into, in the center of every knowledge by defining and saying that you are mathematics, you are science, you are art. And if we're able to see all of these external realities from a personal perspective, then we not only gain an understanding of our environment, but we gain a thorough knowledge of ourselves. So knowledge of self is knowledge of God, and we're going to get into it. We talked about the definition of anatomy. So now we're going to deal with energy. Because most times when we talk about God, we describe him as force and power. He is... The thing that we can't, when things happen in our lives, is that which we can't explain, right? We don't, we don't, it's outside of our conscious mind. A power supreme to the one that we have personally. We say, that's God. Wow, if something happens, you get into a car accident, and your car is totaled, and you come out completely unscratched, you know that that's not because of anything that you did. You know that that was a situation and circumstances beyond your force and power. You attempted to stop that car, but you did not have the ability to stop that car. So you had an accident. But the result of that was that you were unscathed. So you know when that means that a greater force, a greater power, a greater construct was in effect. So we typically understand God as force and power. Well, what is force? I get my notes. What is force? When we talk about force, force is movement or action. Force is energy. But it's very important to know that force involves physical movement physical movement. Something has to move from one place to another for force to be defined and exist in that moment. Physical movement. Force does not exist outside of physicality, brothers and sisters. Energy always is. It never is created, nor is it destroyed. It's defined as the property of matter and radiation, which is manifest as a capacity to perform. In the Latin, it means within work. So energy is within work. Energy is not work. It is within work. And according to physics, it's also defined as the capacity for doing work. So the point of that is when we talk about work, scientifically, it's defined as for, um, force times distance. So it's movement, it's action, but that action has to propel you over a over a space or a period of time, a spectrum of space and time. So force times distance is what work is. So energy is the capacity 
for your force to move you across a span of space and time. The capacity for your force to move you beyond space and time. This word capacity is supremely important, right? Because we can run through this definition and we can, what does that mean? And think that that's not significant, but we're taught through the learning technology with Dynex that it's so important for us to define words. So bear with me as I define these words for you because without definition, a thing does not have form. Yes. So if I turn off these lights and none of the edges of anything in this room exists anymore, it's just darkness. Until you have definition or an outline of a thing, it doesn't exist. So we have to define what capacity is. Capacity is your ability to contain something, the space available to contain. So when we talk about God as force and power or infinite energy, it's just the capacity, infinite capacity. So within us as a human being, we have infinite capacity, but if that capacity is not put to work, then we cannot quantify ourselves as being, living, or doing. Because remember, anything living is constantly growing and expanding. So the body is a manifestation of all the possibilities that exist in the universe. How is that possible? Because spirit equals energy, and energy put to work is electricity or frequency. Y'all get that? Yes. Spirit is energy, and energy put to work is electricity, frequency, movement, right? Without, a, without force, energy just is. And by scientific definition, you have two types of energy. Two classifications. You have potential and kinetic. Potential means it just it just is. It just is. It exists. And that's that's how we describe God. How we've been taught about the reality of God. God is. He's it just he just is. He's everywhere. Infinite. It cannot be defined. But energy, as long as it's potential, it's not doing anything. It's just there. It has to move into kinetic energy in order for there to be force and power. So if we define God as force and power, now we have a whole nother thing to deal with. Because God cannot be God without force and power, but there has to be matter involved. There has to be movement. There has to be substance in order for it to actually be God. Do y'all understand? You follow me? Praise be to Allah. So we're talking about the anatomy of God. We have to bring this thing to a physical reality because we've only been taught about our physical reality and about the reality of God for someone who doesn't desire us to know the truth of ourselves, who never desired us to know the truth about God, who never desired to see us reach our full potential of being one with God. So two types of classifications of energy, potential and kinetic. From there, you have nine types of energy. Thermal energy, sound energy, radiant energy, mechanical energy, gravitational energy, and I'll kind of give you a little example of each. Thermal energy is heat production. So let's bring it to, let's bring it to the anatomy, right? When you cold, <laughs> and your body starts to shiver and that friction is being produced, it's being produced in order to produce heat. You, brothers and sisters, are thermal energy. Sound energy, the waves that are coming in from my mouth as I am forming these words, that is sound energy. Sound energy, you are sound energy. Radiant energy. We all saw the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan give his lecture a few weeks ago, right? And no one can deny that when that black man walked out on that stage, he was radiant. Light was emanating from his being. He looked like he was a glow. We have the power to be a glow, to radiate, radiant energy. You are radiant energy, mechanical energy. For me to move my hand like this, there's a mechanism, my joints, the ligaments, the, the cartilage in between the joints, the fluid that exists there that allows me to make all manner of motion. We are mechanical energy, gravitational energy. When we go down to raise our salah, 
anytime your 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 body is being imposed upon by gravity, if I jump up and I fall back down, that is gravitational energy. We are gravitational energy, elastic energy. The body is elastic. The skin is elastic. If you've ever seen contortionists, you know that elastic energy exists within this framework of the human being. Chemical energy, primary form of chemical energy is our digestive system. Chemi we are a, a biochemical and electric factory, brothers and sisters. We, there are chemical reactions happening every millisecond in order to transmute one substance into another substance. Chemical energy. Nuclear energy. Well, that happens when atoms crack, when atoms are split. A, a minute form and example of that is when the sperm and the ovum come together. That spark of light where those atoms split multiple times in order to begin the foundation of life. Electric energy. We are electric. Rub your foot across the floor a little too, uh, a little too much, and you're gonna get a shock, right? You say, "Where did that come from?" It came from you. You did it. It wasn't the floor. You did it. So electric energy. So here we are in this human form, and within this human form is every type of energy that exists in the universe that we know of. This is all. This is just what the what the, the what the Caucasian has discovered, but the it, the wisdom and knowledge of God is infinite, right. right? So the body itself is the manifestation of all the possibilities that exist in the universe. It is potential energy, simultaneously as it is kinetic energy, in motion. Your cells, right, have contain energy. You could eat something and don't decide not to move at all. <laughs> you are potential energy, but at the same time, there is motion and activity happening on the inside whether you decide to get out of your chair or not. We are potential energy and kinetic energy simultaneously, the seen and the unseen. Primary example of this is with a female child. I don't know if any of you brothers know this, but the reality is that every female child is born with all of her eggs at birth. Excellent. All of her eggs at birth. Yes, so at nine months gestation, when your wife is pregnant with your beautiful baby girl, at nine months within your wife was her grandchildren. Yes. Present. Yes. Right? Her thoughts not only affected and formed the, ch the life that you have right there, but affected her grandchildren. And so was she present with her grandmother. So we are potential energy and kinetic energy all at the same time. Past, present, and future. And we say God is omnipotent, omnipresent. He knows all things. Well, within you, brother and sister, is the data from the eons of time, from the very beginning, right there in your DNA, your cellular structure. We are past, present, and future. Infinite, that's right. Infinite. So, I have here at the bottom battery, a container of cells. So in order for energy to move, there has to be a container. And in science, we know that this reality exists, but somehow when we come to talk about the reality of God, it's all, yeah, all of the, all of the science goes out of the window, right? We, nothing makes sense anymore, right? But the reality is that energy has to have a container in order to transfer from potential energy to kinetic energy. For example, Energy exists. This room is a container. If I want to charge my cell phone, I'm not going to hold my charger up in the air and catch a charge, right? I have to plug it into the container. This building, these four walls are a container. The, the conduit of the wires that travel the energy from the transformer outside to the walls, within, those are containers. And it gives direction, form, flow. So if, if I was to walk around with my charger like this and somebody say, what you doing? I'm trying to catch a charge. You're going to look at me like I'm crazy. What is that something she, I didn't take her medicine this morning, right? <laughs> no, you have, to plug, you have to have a container in order to make use of the energy. 
So we're taught in the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that God created himself into triple darkness and in that, dark, in that darkness was substance just like this room is filled with substance. Every square inch of it is filled with substance. Even what looks like space, there are atoms and molecules present. Seen and unseen. We are all connected. So in that triple darkness, he created himself. That was matter and in the, in the substance, but he, he went to work for, for thousands, trillions of years in order to define and contain himself so that he can move across the darkness and to bring forth everything that is in existence today. So uh, the base example of a battery is a container of cells. In that battery is a container of cells that allows that energy to flow. Well, what are you, brothers and sisters? Your body is made up of cells, container of cells, and at every level of your existence, energy exists in all of those cells. So essentially, we are a battery for the purpose of transmute, transmuting and transferring life force energy, the spirit of God. And within the body, we have certain systems that are responsible for moving this spirit of God or this energy. Two of those primary systems that I like to call the spiritual systems of the body are the endocrine system is the first one. Now typically when we talk about the endocrine system, we only talk about it from the place of oh, our hormones, right? We know that the endocrine system is responsible for our hormones. So some of the glands or the organs that are in your endocrine system are your pineal gland. Pineal gland sits in the center of the brain. Okay? You have your pituitary gland, which sits almost at the base of the brain, directly behind your eyes. A very small, pea-sized shaped gland, right? You have your thyroid gland that's in your throat. You have your thymus gland that's very close to your heart. You have your adrenal glands that are in the center of your being, in your gut area. You have your ovaries and your testes, which are your, the organs that are responsible for the, producing the hormones that regulate your reproductive system. All of these glands are positioned in the body. But these glands also align simultaneously with energy transmitters in the body. In a lot of spiritual systems, these are described as chakras or talk as chakras. But did you know there's a reference for this in Islam? In Islam, these energy centers or vortexes, as they're called, are called lataif. Lataif. And this is, in Islam, no, is the salah system. See, typically when we talk about energy or salah, we'll say, oh, I'm going to go make my salah or make my prayers, right? But the reality is, you don't make salah. Salah exists within you. It is the life force energy within you. The process of performing your prayers is not to make salah, but to raise the salah, to move the energy throughout your body, to activate the life force energy of God throughout your body. So we're not making Salah. Salah was made and given to you as a gift as God breathed his root into you. It is the reality of God that exists within you from the very beginning. So we raise Salah. And as we raise Salah, this energy is responsible for all the primary functions of our bodies. And the reason is directly aligned with the endocrine system because that is the role of the hormones in the body. What are the roles of the hormones? The hormones are throughout the body. They're like a divine sensory activity, right? They're like the body's conductor, or as they said, they're messengers. Isn't that beautiful? The hormones are the body's messengers. They send instructions and disseminate themselves throughout the body in order to give instructions to the organs so that the organs can function properly, right? They help to control how the cells and the organs do their work. There are chemical substances that regulate. And see, in spirituality, you know, as a people right now, being other than ourselves, we don't like to be regulated. <laughs> we don't like to be regulated at all. We don't want any restrictions. We want to do what we want to do. It's a hot girl summer. It's all of those things, right? We don't want to be regulated. But the reality is, is your body is made, like I said, the mind is made to think right. 
The mind is made to think right. And so the body has in, in it regulation, regulates you. But we're living in the world that, in, that encourages irregulation. It encourages disorder. It encourages disruption and chaos. God is a God of order, regulation. But the enemy is one of disorder and chaos. And we can see that evident in our society. But the reality is the activity of disorder and chaos is causing disorder in the body because we're not in alignment with God. Our activity is not in alignment with the manner in which we have been created, which is to be God, to, to have God force energy flow through us, to be the conduit for the spirit of God, to, to resurrect and, and set a foundation for God's kingdom on earth. That's what we were seeing here to do. We were given an assignment, you know, and it says in the scripture in Genesis 1:28, and God said to us, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and of the fowl and over the birds of the air. This was our instruction. So he gave us a job to do. He gave us this power so that we can do a particular job. And what does subdue mean? Subdue means to bring under control. To bring under control. Nothing about that order was to be all over the place. To do anything you want to do. Right? And we know that the power, the true power of God in the human being is when we are under control. Because when we are under control, we are regulated. We are in alignment with the spirit of God. And the power is infinite. Just like we know God's power to be infinite. To infinite capacity. Infinite ability. Ever expanding. Ever growing. Right? Ever evolving. This is the power of being under control and being regulated. You're in alignment. And so when we see these colors that are corresponding with each organ in the endocrine system, each color is representative of a frequency. See, energy is, me is measured through what they call hertz. Frequency. Hertz, right? And that hertz, we most commonly come into contact with that hertz frequency through color, through light. As you see, the sun, right? And you, and you might have learned this in basic science or in art. But you have what they call Roy G. Biv, the light spectrum. Right? You remember that, sis, right? Roy G. Biv. Okay, well, if you didn't know today, now you remember. Roy G. Biv. Roy G. Biv is an acronym to help you remember the spectrum of light. Red, orange, yellow, blue, green, indigo, violet. Red is the lowest of frequency. And violet is the highest of frequency. So Roy G. Biv tells you the mathematical calculation of the light spectrum. So and when we are taking things into our visual cortex, when we're seeing things, when we eat the food, it's a beautiful thing when we recognize how masterfully God has created us and has created our home. Everything, everything is communication. So the strawberry is red because of what? Because it is vibrating on a certain frequency frequency of energy and when you eat it it affects your body with that same frequency of energy a blueberry is blue because what it absorbs that energy from the sun and that energy from the sun is a particular communication that allows the the, the minerals in the soil to formulate in a certain way and you have a blueberry which when you eat it now your body is receiving a oh I know what this is oh I know what to do with this I know how it's going to help where where I can send this nutrients in order for it to help and heal my body to put me in alignment so when we eat living things we nourish our living existence right we nourish our living body so there is a connection between all that this is our home planet brothers and sisters right. so but if we don't have a proper knowledge of ourselves how do we know how to make proper uses of ourselves and how do we know how to do what God instructed us to do which is to subdue the earth to, to set dominion right to multiply and fill the earth but if we don't know that we are intrinsically connected with this, with this earth, if we don't know the majesty and the reality, the power and the capacity of what we've been given, then how can we be obedient to that instruction? Right. So this is one of the body's spiritual systems, the Salah system. Wrong thing. <laughs> our next spiritual system is our central nervous system. The central nervous system connects your brain and your spinal cord and all your nerve endings that, that go into every aspect of your body. It's what controls your movement, your impulses, your thoughts, right? 
it is your body's electromagnetic system, right? It's how you feel, right? How you have sensation, stimuli, which is constant communication. And every aspect of your um, nervous system is regulated and stems from the spinal cord. And isn't this amazing? Look at that spinal cord. What does it look like? When you see it without the flesh, you have the head and then you have the column. It looks like the beginnings of life itself. When we say man carries the idea, doesn't that look like a sperm cell, brothers and sisters? It looks exactly like, so we are, now we are an advanced um, evolution of what we were in the beginning. And every vertebrae on that spinal column is attached to an area of your body or your organ system. So energy is flowing all throughout us, brothers and sisters. And it's interesting that um, neurons are another important, very important part of this God system, this reality, this anatomy of God, the spiritual system that exists within the human being. Because neurons are specialized cells that transmit electric flow in the body or nerve impulses in the body. So when you think, I want to go downstairs to get me a cup of water, your neurons respond to that thought. And before you know it, you're out of your chair and your body and your and mechanical energy, right, is into play and you're moving, right? You're moving. So this is this is a beautiful thing. But these all of these systems, brothers and sisters, can be disrupted. So I should have put a subtext on this lecture entitled The Anatomy of God and the Death Plot of the Enemy. Because when you don't know yourself. When your enemy knows you better than you know yourself, that's, right. that's, a, that's a terrible situation to be in, brothers and sisters. And we, and we know from the lessons that it says, Yaqub's children were taught trichnology and how to master the original man, right? So as we have been lost from the knowledge of ourselves, they've been given the knowledge on how to master us, how to master ours, to master us. And so when they know what, you, what the spiritual systems are, they know how to, be, how to create disruption and disorder, right? And we don't realize what's happening to us because we don't know our own selves. So we can't protect ourselves, right? So here we talk about the elevation of man. And what's interesting with this is that even without a knowledge, a thorough knowledge of ourselves, God came to give us our nature back in the form of a religion. See, Islam is not a religion. Islam is the nature of the human being. So he came to give us back our nature in the construct of a religion with rituals and rites, but it's not just we're supposed to be conscious of the rituals so that we can be engaged with the reality of the rituals, but we should really start striving to grow to understand the science because there is no mystery God. Everything that exists on a spiritual level will make manifest on a physical level. Science, mathematics should bear witness to what we know to be true of spirit. So here we are, We're gonna, I'm going to do my best to try to substantiate some of this. So voodoo, the act of voodoo, God came back to give us back our nature and our religion. The act of voodoo, where we cleanse our hands and our body before prayer, water is a neutralizing force. So you could have been in contact with all sorts of energies, all sorts of things all day, right? But when you go into voodoo, you're actually neutralizing all that you had come into contact before. So you, so you could have been functioning at a low hertz energy, right? You low because of somebody, your, your mama, your children have made you mad, your boss won't give you a raise, the people in traffic, was somebody cussed you out, all of that, right? You, you, you went out to eat last night and you ordered something you weren't supposed to, so now you're a little discombobulated, you don't feel like yourself, your stomach hurt, because you ate that stuff at Cheesecake Factory that you had no business eating because it wasn't alive. None of it had color. That's right. None of it was real. None of it. So you didn't take in any good energy, right? Mm -hmm. 
You took in dead things. So now you're vibrating on a very low level. But the beauty of God is that he gives us five opportunities throughout the day to neutralize, to cleanse ourselves of all of that. To neutralize and to recalibrate ourselves, to get ourselves back in alignment. Back in alignment, right? So when we look at this picture here and we see raising Salah, the prostrations are the positions of prayer you look at this spinal column. Each position of prayer, and I'm gonna go back to here so you can see the positions, but just hold this image of the spinal column in your head, okay? Praise be to Allah. Each position of prayer causes pressure on a particular vertebrae in the spine, right? Each position of prayer. So that motion, you're pre you're, there's pressure being pressed on those nerves, right? To send sensations throughout the body. So you're literally reactivating and calibrating your life force system, your nervous system. And this uh, position where we put our heads on the floor. So that, did you know that there was a scientific study that was done very recently? Try to find it in my notes. Scientific study that was done recently by, bear with me brothers and sisters, I got a lot of notes. <laughs> and I've kind of gotten them out of order, but we're gonna find it. And I'm gonna give you this data, cause it's amazing. It's amazing. Because we should always try to substantiate what it is that we know. Because we know that, uh, that God is, and it's all encompassing, right? So nothing exists in this reality without God bearing witness to it. So we should be able to substantiate these truths with science and mathematics. So there was a study. Hmm, I still can't find it. Okay. Okay, here we go. So there was a study done. So I'm going to make this point, and then I'm going to go to the study. So when we raise the lot, our cerebral spinal fluid. So this, there's a fluid that's contained within the spinal column. When we raise the lot, our cerebral spinal fluid flows due to the forces generated by cardiac pulsations and pulmonary respiration. This is a scientific fact. When you Google how the cerebral spinal fluid flow, it will tell you that it's due to the forces power, right? Motion, because we know that force can't happen without motion and without matter being present. Right. So, due to the forces generated by cardiac pulsations and pulmonary res respirations. So, that means when your heart's beating and your, your, your breathing hard, your respiration is going up, that causes your CSF fluid to spow, flow, your cerebral spinal fluid. So, what's happening here when we're in the positions of Salah? You know, all of us know after you go up and down a few times, that heart starts, you start feeling the lifeblood pumping through you, right? Your breathing becomes a little, you're a little more focused on your breathing in order to get up and down. So those movements are causing your cerebral, cerebral spinal fluid to flow. And when you get down into this position where your forehead is on the floor, now all of that newly charged fluid with the word of God, as my brother Gilbert said, the Arabic language is our original language. It's a vibratory language that concerns hurt, living hurt, high vibration energy in those words because we talked about what? Sound energy. It's a real thing, right? When we say you can speak life into existence. In the beginning there was the word and the word was with God and the word became God and the word became flesh. That's a reality. Yeah. Sound energy is a real thing. So as we're reciting our prayers and we're speaking the Arabic language or even the, the vibration of the energy um, of the English, English language, that language, that sound energy is charging that cerebral spinal fluid. And when you get down into this position where your forehead is on the floor, now all of this newly charged charged fluid of electromagnetic energy um, charged with the spirit and the word of God is now flowing over your brain. <laughs> flowing over your brain. <laughs> flowing over your brain. And you get up from that prayer rug renewed and refreshed. We all bear witness to the feeling that we have over Salah. Yeah. After Salah. Praise be to Allah. So here we go. I found the information about the uh, research. So according to research conducted by the University of Malaya's Biological Engineering um, 
organization, the University of Malaya's Biomedical Engineering Program. It was outlined, this study, the details of this study was outlined in an article in the journal entitled Applied Psychophysiology. It's a medical journal entitled Applied Psychophysiology. And in this study, was done on Muslims, where the brain waves of Muslims were monitored with EEG technology. Right. So EEG technology is brain wave technology. It's where they put the nodes on your forehead and they can notice and uh, notate the frequency of your brain waves. So in this study, this is what they did, 370 people. They monitored their brain waves while they were performing Salah. And the, the research showed that during, while they were performing Salah, that their brain waves entered what they call alpha state while in the prostration position. Now we just talked about how when you put your forehead to the ground, the cerebral spinal fluid starts to flow and it comes over the brain, right? Because we know the brain rests in water, right? But now this water is charged with the spirit of God, right? With the reality of God. And when you're in that prostration position, these alpha states were notated. And alpha states are very similar to the states that they say you get from meditation, right? So even though we didn't know ourselves and God came to give us a knowledge of ourselves, he gave us a practice that would literally, if we were obedient, would put us back in alignment with him, right? So this says obedience, is, obedience leads to understanding. So now we're at a place where we can have these conversations and we can grow into the understanding of the science behind these things, but our obedience through, from the revelation of God would have given us the results, would have given us the results, putting us in alignment with God. So this is, a, this is a medical study because so many of the studies of brain waves were done on other religions, Christianity and Hinduism. But a group of Muslims say, you know, we want, we want to apply this technology to our study to show and prove that the performance of Salah, the raising of Salah, can put us into one communion with God. So God came to make us into himself. And we talked about capacity, right? Capacity is your ability. Well, and past, we talked about past, present, and future. The reality is, brothers and sisters, and well, we're not there yet. The reality is, brothers and sisters, that we have control over what, over, over what will be. We have control over what will be. We see the beauty and the majesty of this anatomy that we've been given, the anatomy of God, right? And the capacity, we know the capacity, but our vision, our thought has the, the ability to evolve us into eventual perfection. We said past, present, and future. I am my ancestors. I am present in this here moment, being willing to activate the God force within me, but I have to have a vision. So who do you want to become? What does the kingdom of God look like? What are we striving for. In the Quran it says every man gets what he will strive for. So what are we striving for? What is the vision that we have? What are we putting our active force and our life force energy toward? And so the reality is we, as we perform these rituals, as we perform a line, we come into greater knowledge of who we are and what this vessel is that we've been given and its capacity which is infinite just as God is infinite. Because the brain, when you think a thought the body is in obedience to that. The cells don't argue, right? <laughs> the cells don't argue and say, nah, I'm not about to do all that. <laughs> I am not about to do all of that. No, they hear and obey. Every thought, no matter what the thought is. So what if your thought was, I want to be able to survive on one meal a day. Well, that thought becomes law. You, if you constantly going that thought over in your mind, then your cells are going to obey that, right? Because we have, so we have the capacity to evolve in whatever we want to. And the knowledge that we've been given by God and the person of Master Farah Muhammad is an infinite knowledge. So we must ask ourselves if he wanted to make us into himself, then what he gave us is if we study it, if we obey it, within it is the vibrational frequency that would allow us to grow into who he is, right? That's it, brothers and sisters. It's on us. It's on us. 
How strong is your foundation? Will you survive, right? And so the first thing is to be aware because energy follows awareness. You can't move towards a thing. You can't, there is no, because the beginning has to have direction, flow, and force. You can't go that way unless you know something exists on the other end, right? So energy follows away until we make our minds up firm and we believe, hey, you know what? I have been given a great gift, the best gift in the world. I have infinite capacity. I can command my cells to do what I want them to do. My body can contain infinite amounts of energy and it will evolve me towards that perfection in order to manifest that ability. So we say, who makes hell, rain, and, and snowstorms, right? God does that. Well, you are God, brothers and sisters. How do we reach that point of eventual perfection? What has to be done? What type of practice? What type of thought? What type of diet do we have to be on in order to evolve ourselves toward that? And it's possible because if it wasn't possible, like he said, he came to make us into himself. God removed the impossible when he created himself out of nothingness, right? So the question is, Praise be to a lot. The question is, what do we want? What do we want? How, what is the vision that we can hold in our minds? Right? Or better yet, what is the thought that God had in his mind when he created you from the beginning? Because he created everything to evolve towards his perfection. So how are we going to maximize this beautiful blueprint that we've been given? Right? Maximize our potential. Activate this life force energy. Because it exists within us, but unless we activate it, it doesn't turn into electricity, something that can be transformed into all of these manners of energy. Right? Praise be to Allah. And so we talked about the enemy a little earlier because we don't know ourselves. We're getting to know ourselves every day, even while preparing this lecture. I'm getting to know. I'm like, ooh. I told my husband last night, I said, ooh, I had to get down and pray. After I got to this part, I, when that Adon went off, after putting this together, I, you feel crazy not uh, yeah. praying after you know this, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm like, uh... I am doing something, Lord, in your name, but I need to go hit this prayer up. Yes. Praise be to Allah. So the enemy knows us well. He's kept us deaf, dumb, and blind, and lost to the knowledge of ourselves for the purpose of him utilizing this knowledge against us. That's right. So we're going to talk about the deaf, the wickedly wise enemy of God. And the minister described him as wickedly wise. He's very wise. Very wise. Right? You know, hate, hate and envy will drive you to do some things, right? You stay up to 3, 4 o'clock in the morning trying to figure out, how can I get back at them, yeah. right? How can, how can I conquer these people? They make me feel a way about myself. Yeah. You know, so he, he dedicated, he put the time in 6,000 years figuring out how he could prevent us from growing into the reality of what God intended for us to be. So the wickedly wise enemy of God. Brothers and sisters, we are dealing with a lot in this time. Focus is on right now the media, political, reparations, uh, racial profiling, all of these various things, right? Police killings of our people. And all of that is problematic, severely problematic. But we can't take for granted the multiple ways in which the enemy has strived to master us and to keep us from coming into our power. So while we're having those conversations, it's supremely important that we have these conversations. And I want to give thanks right now to um, two people in particular um, who I pulled information from, who st I've studied their works in order to help me prepare this portion of the lecture. Um, our dear brother, Dr. Akili Muhammad from my 45 in Houston, Texas, and um, our dear brother, Dr. Wesley Muhammad. Because he's on it. All praise is due to a lie for him. We talk about the pot plot, right? The genetically modified marijuana, right? Alcoholism in our communities, the effect that it has on our minds, on our beings, right? And um, his most recent work, um, Food by Zip Code. Yes which was just released, so I encourage you to go on social media, follow that brother, and download his research, 
because it's supremely important and it fits right into what we were saying because we know that our power base is the reality of the spirit of God within us as human beings and this vessel is our endocrine system and our nervous system, right? right. Well, the enemy knows that too. That's right. He knows that too and he doesn't, he doesn't care about a few of his people being casualties in order to, to keep us from becoming who we are, right? right? So endocrine disruptors is his thing. This is what, because he knows if he disrupts, if we consume that which disrupts our endocrine system, then we don't have the capacity to control the functions of our body. We don't have the capacity to contain the life force energy that's necessary in order for us to increase our capacity and to do the work of God, to do the work that's in alignment with the creator. That's right. So some of these endocrine disruptors, heavy metals, mm. aluminum, lead, did you know that studies have been found that a lot of fast food now, people are finding metal pieces in their food? Mm. Metal, shredded up metal. Right, and once those heavy metals come into your body, oftentimes they manifest themselves in the form of cysts or tumors because the body is a beautiful mechanism that desires to survive no matter what. So it will collect all of those heavy metals and encapsulate it and put it somewhere in the area of the body because it doesn't want it to be free flowing. Free flowing, disrupting everything. Okay, I'm going to collect this and I'm going to put it over here in the form of a tumor or a cyst. Right? Heavy metals. So when we see cancer coming up in our communities, this is what's one of the main reasons for cancer, right? Heavy metals, fluoride. Fluoride uh, disrupts the function of the cerebral spinal fluid. It lulls the brain to sleep. So science tells us that a fully functioning, vibrant, awake brain functions at a frequency of 14 to 30 hertz. So your brain, when you are wide awake, should be functioning at a frequency of 14 to 30 hertz, right? Well, when you consume fluoride or fluoride is in the body, it lulls the brain to sleep. So you're moving on more into a relaxed state, which is about 10 hertz. So when the messenger said that we were deaf, dumb, and blind, we were, and he said that we could be wide awake men, it was interesting that in this study, they used the language wide awake. Mm -hmm. And we're taught that big fields awake the wide awake man, right? <clears throat> So that has to have everything to do with the, the vibrational frequency of your brain. How fast is your brain oscillating? What if there's heavy metals and fluoride in your body, it's, it can't do its job. Your, your senses are dull. You, it's very hard to focus, right? <clears throat> you don't have clarity of thought. You ever experienced uh, brain, what they call brain fog? Yeah. This is a result of endocrine disruptors, additives and preservatives in food. Everything is on the shelf now. Can last forever. You get a loaf of bread from the store and it can literally, mold won't show up forever. Right? <laughs> and it's at a certain point, you're excited about that because I don't want my groceries to go bad. But then after a while, you're like, okay, Lion, you need to rock. Something is not right here. Something is not right. This apple, I forgot this apple was right there. And it's been months, and this apple is still relatively round and green. This is a problem, brothers and sisters. Additives and preservatives, because what happens to that when it comes into your body? Can your body digest that? Because what digests and decomposes the apple in the reality, in, in our homes? Bacteria, the enzymes that are in our body are responsible for breaking that apple down. Well, if the, the natural bacteria in the environment can't make the apple rot, right. truly your body can't digest that and break that down. So it's collected in your system as waste, as waste. And that's not including the pesticides that's on it. So those chemicals leach into the body. They pollute the blood, uh, ultimately ill affect the brain and the organ function. So now your endocrine system is, is, is lower and lower. The hertz, the energy level, its ability to vibrate on a certain level is lower and lower. Lower and lower. Pharmaceuticals. And a lot of people say, well, we don't take medicine. Well, did you know that in most um, city water, because people flush medicines down the toilet yeah. That's right. that, and, and you can't really, you can't boil that out. Right. Matter of fact, when you boil chemicals, it exacerbates their function. They expand. Their potency expands. So you can't get that out with just a regular boiling. So even though you might not take pharmaceuticals, peep, there's pharmaceuticals in the water. That's right. In the water. Dyes and perfumes, sisters. Our beauty habits are killing us. 
our beauty habits are killing us. Makeup, hair gel, all of these different things are pouring toxins and pollution into our body, disrupting our organ function, disrupting our ability to be who God intended for us to be. And this is not by accident. It's not by accident. Soy, alcohol, marijuana, and chemtrails in the environment. So this is why God came and he gave us a regimen. Not just one thing to do, but he gave us a lifestyle. A complete lifestyle that will protect us from the onslaught of the enemy and even our own, and even our own ignorance if we were to just obey. Yes. Fake food. Like we, we talked about the apple, where they did a study on McDonald's fries, they'll last forever. Yeah. <laughs> you have a whole burger fry statue in your back seat, right? If you forget that's there. Chicken nuggets, well, we can't call them chicken nuggets. As Dr. Wesley say, uh, Mac nuggets. They don't even say chicken no more, right? No. Mac nuggets. That thing turns into a brick. And then, so endocrine disruptors and radiation. Technology, how beautiful this technology is that allows us to connect globally. But if we would advance our own physical being and elevate that salah and raise our salah, we, we would need all of this technology. Technology in one way is good, but it also keeps us from elevating and develop our own natural abilities. I could think about Sister Camille, and you ever had that happen? You think about somebody, yeah. and then next thing you know, they call you up. You're like, oh, girl, I was just thinking about you. Yeah. You know, that's because I ate, that's because you ate that apples and them oranges and that real food yesterday, and you, and you stopped taking in all of this fake stuff. Now you realize, oh man, I said I wanted to get a new iPad, and then next thing you know, you're on the internet and someone's doing an iPad giveaway. Right. And you sign up for it, and I just said I wanted me a new iPad, or I just said I wanted a new dress, and my sister gifts me with a dress, right? See, this is the latent power of God that lives within us. But the enemy is constantly striving to interrupt the process so that we don't come into the knowledge of our own power and ability. God is a man. God is a man. That's right. So low frequency emissions from technology, Wi-Fi signals, excessive cell phone use, sound pollution, and light pollution. Then this is huge for me because I did not realize how serious, and this just goes to show that the, this world, this man who's ruling this world is not only taking a toll on us, he's taking a toll on the planet. Every creature in existence is suffering under the rulership of this man. Light pollution. We were blessed to go to the planetarium with our children recently, and they played a film on light pollution. Very powerful. The reality is, is, brothers and sisters, when it's dark outside, it's supposed to be dark. <laughs> it's supposed to be dark. Most nights, most nights on, the, on the city night, you can go outside and you might not see no stars. And we, many of us have become to believe, as, as well as myself, that the reason we can't see the stars is because of smog or air pollution. Well, the reality is, the primary reason we cannot see the stars is because of light pollution. Because light has to contrast with the darkness in order for it to make, because we said defined, right? There has, to be, there has to be a definition. And when there's so much excessive synthetic light, there can be, there's no definition, there's no finite separation between life and dark, light and darkness. So we don't even get to experience the beauty of our cosmos. The reality is when it's dark outside, you should be able to see the Milky Way. You can see it. That's the gift that God intended to give us when he created the heavens and the earth. When he chose this spot as his home. He, it was the perfect spot for him to view his creation. But the enemy of God has made it to where we can't, we can't even see our own creation. Light pollution is such a problem that it has disrupted the circadian rhythms. The circadian rhythms is a natural body cycle. Right, when to wake up, when to go to sleep. This helps regulate our heat function in our body. It helps to regulate our moods. It helps us to go to sleep at night. Um, if you don't have good blackout curtains in the city, it's never gonna get dark in your room, right? You can turn every light on the house, but the street lights are so bright that light is permanent. You're like, okay, I can't get no sleep like this. It's, it's, it's look like noon outside. <laughs> 
right? So it's disrupting the circadian rhythms, not only of us as human beings, but of the creatures. Uh, it said that uh, nesting, um, when turtles are hatching on sea, there's so much light pollution that they confuse the light pollution for the glare off of the ocean. So rather than those baby turtles actually moving toward the ocean to rest in their home place, they're coming farther and farther inland and eventually die because they're confused by the light, the light pollution. Birds trying to fly south for the winter, they are crashing into, crashing into lights because they think that it's something else. So everything in nature is built on this circadian rhythm. But our, our death style, the death style that has been given to us by this made man has disrupted everything. So it affects us, brothers and sisters. So we have to be war to get this sound pollution. Sound pollution, you can, you know, trying to meditate in the city is, is a serious thing, right? You're trying to raise your salat even at 5 o'clock in the morning. Even at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, it's people outside. The bus is running. And in New Orleans, you might hear some second line music or some trumpets playing, right? <laughs> And we love our culture, but in reality, there are supposed to be moments where we experience silence. So, because again, we say sound is energy, right? That's information. That's transferring some information. It's waves. Our body is constant in constant communication with the environment. And if there's always sound pollution, always light pollution, you never at rest. The mind can never be at rest. The central nervous system is never at rest. So it gets worn down. Stress. We become easily stressed. We experience anxiety. We experience de depression. You ever had a moment where you just feel so tired? You're like, Oh, I didn't even do nothing. Why am I so? Oh, why am I so tired? I need a nap. And you think you you haven't done anything with your physical body, active force movement, but your body, your central nervous system, your endocrine system is coming into contact, is in constant communication and work with all of these external factors. It will exhaust you. Yes. It will exhaust you. So these are the things. This is this is the plot of the enemy. Endocrine disruptors. They know this because. I, I researched it and I got a lot of this information. <laughs> so they know they know the reality of who we are. It's us that don't know it because we don't know we suffer the most. And keeping us out of this knowledge is intentional. Because if we were to come into the knowledge of who we are, if we were to understand that we are descendants from the creator, that, that the reality, the knowledge, the data, the information, the capacity, the energy is existing within us. Yes, you, sister. You who think you may be nothing. You, brother, you who think that you don't have a purpose. You, whether, you, whether you say, I want to be a doctor or a lawyer, then you don't have to be any of that. Just be. Just be. See, we, we, we grow to confuse existing, existence with doing. Someone says, who are you? Oh, I'm a doctor. Oh, I'm a hairstylist. Oh, I work in the bank. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm this, I'm that. No, that's your doing. That's what you do. Who are you, brothers? I, I am God. I am God. I'm the, I, I am a manifestation of the originator. I am a vessel for life first force energy. I am powerful. I am light. I am love. I am all of that, right? And we say that in humility because we know if we don't submit to the process that God has implemented in order for us to stay on that path, then we will surely be nothing. Because we're not, we haven't been on the path for over 400 years since we've been under the sojourn of this man. And we see that our hands have been tied, our eyes have been bounded, our ears have been plugged, and our feet have been shackled. We have a hard time making our mind up saying we're going to do something, right? right? You mull over for a year for two. Goals. Write a goal list this year. And you, you, you just you turn the page over and rewrite them next year. What, what is the problem? What, what is the barrier to us making manifest that which we desire? And the more we come into the knowledge of ourselves and how to create a safe haven for that which God has given us by eradicating the things that are meant to disrupt us and disturb us on the reality of God, then the more we can come into our power and begin to do that which God instructed us to do, which is to subdue the earth, right? right. To build and establish the kingdom of God on earth. Yes. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> yes. Islam is the solution. And we said earlier today that Islam is not a religion. Islam is our nature. 
It's the knowledge of ourselves, the knowledge of our enemy, the knowledge of the time, the knowledge of God. These thorough knowledges is what gives us the wisdom to do that which we need. And God didn't just come and give us a spiritual teaching. He gave us a practical teaching. That's right. He gave us, because understanding that God is man and man is God, okay, now I have to give you, tell you what to do. Not just what to believe, right. not just what to believe, but what to do to make this belief manifest in your life, to grow from belief to knowledge to wisdom. That's right. And wisdom, it only comes after you have activated knowledge, right. brothers and sisters. So how to eat to live? It's essential. It's essential, and I'm coming um, to understand that more and more every day. As we delve further into these teachings and this study and learning more about ourselves, how to eat to live is so supremely important. And it's so simple. <laughs> it really is. It's so simple, but it, 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 feel, it seems so difficult. But everything is difficult when you're living in a world that's in complete opposition of God. But in truth, brothers and sisters, it really is simple. And the more we understand the why, right? See, God doesn't, God doesn't punish us for asking why. Amen. The beauty of this teaching in the nation of Islam is that what we're given upon registration is a list of questions and answers. I don't think the God was upset <laughs> with, with the students asking questions. He encouraged them to ask questions. And not only that, he copied down their answers and he passed those questions and answers down to us that we may memorize so that we can align our minds with his. So we, there's nothing wrong with wanting to know why. Why do we eat navy? Why is navy beans prescribed to us? Why should we eat? Why raw milk, right? Why one meal a day? And the more we come into the understanding of the knowledge is the knowledge of self, which is the knowledge of God, and the knowledge of the enemy and the knowledge of the time, the why becomes so very apparent. So very apparent. But obedience will lend to our understanding. But I was a why child. You know, we, we like in the scripture it said, we hard-headed, stiff neck. <laughs> why, mama, why I got to do that? Why I need to do that? Right? Praise be to Allah. <laughs> so we ask why. because, But we're scientists. We should ask why and understand why. Did you know, brothers and sisters, that raw milk <clears throat> is actually a sheath for the nervous system? So what is a sheath? A sheath is a protective coating or a covering. So when you drink the raw milk, it actually coats your nervous system. Coats your nervous system. It soothes you. It, 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 it causes your body to produce serotonin. So when we're dealing in the world and we're dealing with all these low frequency emissions that are disrupting our nervous system, we're dealing with stress on a job, with excessive cell phone use, Wi-Fi signals everywhere. If you were to see a map of the Wi-Fi signals, it would look like you was in a spider's web because everybody has a Wi-Fi in their home. So this signal is emitting this way. So walking down, just imagine walking down the street. If you were to visit with the visible spectrum to see the Wi-Fi signals, you would feel like you were trapped in a spider's web. And although we don't see it with the visible eye, our nervous system is picking up on all of this. So when we drink the raw milk, we're actually sheathing and protecting our nervous system from the onslaught of all of this commun energy communication. Right? It's a beautiful, beautiful teaching. I'm so grateful for Master Farah Muhammad and the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The Navy Bean. The Navy Bean. The Navy Bean is a builder, it's a nutrient, but it's also a detoxifier. The Navy Bean will help the body eliminate heavy metals, will eliminate fluoride, the preservatives, the pharmaceuticals. So when we're told to eat the Navy Bean every day, it's not just because, you know, eventually we're going to be on a hard time, so you want to eat Navy Beans now every day so that when the revolution break out, you'll be used to eating beans. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever rationale that we tell ourselves, right? It's not just because of that. It's, it's because God knew the enemy. Just like the enemy knows us, God knows him. And he gave up us a prescription so that we can survive the attack of the enemy, the wickedly wise agenda of the enemy, right? So that we can survive and continue to evolve, grow, and elevate so that he can utilize us so that we can be proper vessels to build the kingdom of God on earth. Right? But if we don't take the prescription, it says given to us as a prescription. But if we don't take the prescription, then we'll find ourselves sick. That's right. 
right? So the power of the Navy being, eating one meal a day, fasting, whole wheat bread, all of these very nutrient dense, right? So all of these things that are given to us as a prescription for our ailments to help us, to help carry us through, brothers and sisters. That's right. To help carry us through. So as I close, I just want to give thanks to Allah for Master Farah Muhammad and his coming. He gave us a manual, right, to operate this technology called the vessel in the anatomy of God. He gave us a manual, an operating system, right? And the beauty of this operating system is that there are constant downloads and upgrades available to us. Constant downloads and upgrades available to us so that we can continue to enhance in our capacity, yeah. right? But every, you, we've all had computers before, right? Where you're trying to do something on your computer and then that little ding comes up and it says, you have updates available. And you're like, I do not have time right. to wait for this. thing. It's going to be updated for the next hour and I have something to do. Right? <laughs> I don't have time to deal with the update right now. And eventually you realize you need the update. Because now you're not able to do certain things that you desire to do. Now you're not able to send that presentation to the person that wants to receive it because you, like me, I still have PowerPoint 207, I'm shame. <laughs> I still have the, the, the old version of PowerPoint. So now that my friend got a, a, a Mac Pro, they like, I can't, I can't interpret that. You have to upgrade your system. You have to upgrade your system. So the reality is that God has given us an operating system, a divine operating system, where upgrades and downloads are available to us on a regular basis. All we have to do is to click the button and to receive the upgrade and the download. And it comes through prayer and fasting, brothers and sisters, and eating the proper foods. His desire for us was to make it to the hereafter. And even if you don't make it, brothers and sisters, if we rear our children um, and give them the manual from the beginning, that you don't, we don't, they don't have to scramble through the dark right. trying to figure out how to unlock the iPhone and utilize it by guessing, right? right. Because we got it secondhand, but if they get it from birth, then they're able to master the manual from the beginning and to, and to know how to function and to utilize the body that they've been given, right? And to, to know how to continue connect with God and upgrade their reality. He came to give us a thorough knowledge of himself and those who came before us so that we might be inspired to get up and do something for ourselves, to obey that which we are being guided to obey. This will put us on a path toward the liberation of our people and grant us freedom, justice, equality, and Islam. And Islam means peace. What greater thing, when we say assalamu alaikum, right, giving one another the greetings, what greater thing is it that we desire but to have peace, brothers and sisters? That's right. And peace is not just a, a spiritual concept. Peace is balance. Peace is equilibrium. Peace is homeostasis. Homeostasis. When everything is in balance, right? So when everything is in balance, what we're putting in is wholesome, then what we get put out is wholesome, right? There's balance in our being. That is peace. So we can say peace to one another all day and give the greetings of peace and wish peace and pray for peace, brothers and sisters. But if we're not doing what is necessary in order to put our physical reality, the vessel of God for its energy in a state of peace, then what type of peace do we truly have? Eventually that peace will be disrupted. That's right. With a reality check, right? Yes. Disease, yes. disorder, disharmony, confusion, broken relationships, yes. destruct, destruction in our communities. Yes. And this is what we're seeing. We're seeing the reality of being out of homeostasis, yes. out of peace. Yes. So God came to put us back into peace. Ooh, to put us back into peace. Yes. He is the supreme being. Yes. And we can't, we can't shirk on it today, y'all. He is the supreme being. Yes. When we say the supreme being, meaning his vessel, his body, his anatomy, because he is a man, his anatomy has been elevated, upgraded, advanced to the point where he can contain the capacity of the life force energy that exists in all of the universe. Can you imagine that? To be that elevated. 
that your physical being has the capacity to contain the life force energy of the universe, that vibration of frequency. And he came to make us into himself, brothers and sisters. So the more we know ourselves, we know, the more we know our uh, anatomy and just the basic vessel in which God has gifted us, if we could just maximize this and maximize what we already have, then God will bless us with much more and advance us and elevate us, right? We don't have to age. That's a falsehood. Right, that's right. We don't have to age. That's right. We don't have to age at all. If the cells are, see, God said be fruitful and multiply. Well, your cells have the capacity to multiply and replicate themselves. Did you know you get new skin every 30 days? The bone, your bones renew themselves every 10 years. You don't have the same bones in your body that you did 10 years ago. So what you do today affects your reality tomorrow because you are God. You have the capacity to create your future. So brothers and sisters, understanding the anatomy of self is understanding the anatomy of God. And, and God desires to make us into himself. He desires for us to be able to maximize this vessel that he's given us. He know, only he knows the capacity and the potential of us. So what we have to ask ourselves is, are we willing to take the prescription? Are we willing to receive the manual on how to operate this system? Are we willing to reject the trick of the devil? Right? When we know, re look, I say don't count calories, count chemicals. Because the chemicals that are in the environment are disrupting your own body's natural ability, his chemical reaction. So we say chemical energy, the reaction system and the digestion. So when we receive those things, it disrupts our ability to do what's necessary for us to align to God. So we have to be always on the alert as we've been instructed, right? Guard all temple property in view. And all temple property in view, first and foremost, begins with you. So don't just take anything. When someone gives you something, you flip that thing over, you check it out. Amen. What is this? Amen. Because I'm on a mission and assignment from God himself right. to be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> To make his, make his power known in the earth by what I do with my time, the work that I put in, right? So we have to be stewards, good stewards over the gift that God has given us. So brothers and sisters, at this time, I'm going to close. I pray to Allah that I have said something of value to you all. That, that somewhere in this, we got a better understanding of who we are as a people. Because the more we know ourselves, the, more, the deeper we can fall in love with ourselves. And the more that we love ourselves, the more that we can love one another. And truly, unity is necessary in order for us to reach the goal, which is to establish the kingdom of God on earth. I thank Allah for the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, because I would have nothing of value to offer without these two men, with these three men. Master for our Muhammad indeed. So brothers and sisters, I'm going to close and leave you all in the, in the nation's greeting words of peace of as alaikum. Well, as well. And I want to thank you for being patient. I know it was a lot of data, a lot of information. It was school, right? <laughs> but that's absolutely what's necessary in this time. Yes. We have to be re-educated yes. into the knowledge of who we are yes. so that we can truly be who God intended for us to be. So once again, I'm Alaikum, brothers and sisters. Praise be to Allah.